Good evening, and uh, thank you so much uh, for the presentation, Deb. Uh, we are going together, so today we will go far. <laughs> and uh, you see, even though I'm Chinese, I love uh, Roman, Greek culture, and Western civilization, and all the paintings they have from the early centuries uh, to the early 20th century. Uh, beyond Impressionists, I can't cope too much. <laughs> so today, we, we talk about crossing the cultural divide. And uh, I think I'm very privileged to have this opportunity to come from Hong Kong to Sydney, because we are both uh, very international cities. Uh, actually, in Hong Kong, living and working, we cross the cultural divide every day. Uh, Hong Kong, uh, we like to think, uh, is Asia's world city. And we have all sorts of nationalities there. We pride ourselves on being a free and open society. And this openness, this freedom, has brought Hong Kong quite a few benefits, like uh, last 24 years, the US Heritage Foundation has uh, rated Hong Kong as the freest economy on Earth. But it's all not just good news in Hong Kong. We have challenges. And in the last few decades, we have had to cope with two major changes. Firstly, China decided to open up to the rest of the world uh, in 1978. Four modernizations and open door policy. And secondly, uh, Britain and China agreed that Hong Kong should revert to Chinese sovereignty in 1997. So uh, we have to rely on our international friends uh, to make things continue to take well for Hong Kong. Australia is one of these international friends. Uh, we communicate all the time with uh, the Australian consulate. The Australian Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong is one of the largest foreign chambers. And this is uh, Australian International School in Kowloon, Hong Kong. It's very popular not just among uh, Australian families, but also among Hong Kong families. Now, in Hong Kong, in dealing with those two challenges that I mentioned just now, particularly in dealing with the reversion of sovereignty over Hong Kong from Britain to China, we have two fundamental considerations. We need to respect Chinese sovereignty. And at the same time, we need to keep Hong Kong going as a free and open society. How can we do that? Well, sometimes I like to tell my friends from overseas that as a Hong Kong Chinese person, guys like us, girls like us, we have two halves of the mind. With one half of the mind, we can speak English and understand Western civilization. With the other half of the mind, we speak Chinese, and understand how things work in mainland China, how deals and arrangements are done. So it's not surprising that uh, due to hard work, we find some way of moving forward between these two fundamental considerations. There is actually some tension there. And the artists live amidst that tension and secure the best possible deal for Hong Kong by being persistent, by being patient, and by being imaginative. Now, let's look at two such instances, OK? Now, in uh, 1996, I, by then I served in Hong Kong governments for something like 18 years. The governments decided to appoint me uh, to become a head of department. But they gave me a job which was really difficult. They asked me to be director of the Hanover Ceremony Office. Now, you all have deadlines in your work. I had an absolute deadline, no delays whatsoever. 30th June, 1st July, 1997, Hong Kong had to revert to China. So when I was given this job in mid-1996, I surveyed my portfolio. And I found that after talking for several years, Britain and China had made no progress whatsoever. <laughs> and they couldn't even agree on a venue for the handover ceremony. Now, you, you wonder why. Well, I'll tell you why. You see, the British like to do military parades. 
Now, those of you who have been uh, to London Buckingham Palace, you may know that every year in June, Her Majesty would preside over a ceremony called Trooping the Colour. So for the Hong Kong handover ceremony, uh, the British government proposed that there should be an open door policy, open air policy, and uh, there should be a venue on which British troops could be paraded. Now, the Chinese government had a, an entirely different set of considerations. First question they ask, uh, open air venue? What if there is a typhoon? What if it rains? And of course, at the back of their minds, they also consider they will be sending the most senior leaders from Beijing to Hong Kong. Uh, they wouldn't want any unnecessary exposure uh, to an open air venue. So I pondered over my challenge, and I knew there was no way I could pull the two sides together. So I decided to cut the Gordian knots. And I decided to propose this, that there should be a British farewell ceremony in the final hours of British rule, late afternoon, 30th June, 1997. It would be solely a British ceremony. And then around midnight, uh, we could have a joint handover ceremony at the Hong Kong Convention, Convention Exhibition Center to be held indoors. Joint ceremony, Britain and China. So I put forth this package uh, to Governor Chris Patton. He supported it, it was pretty good. And then we put it forth to Britain and China. Both sovereign governments accepted this. And the farewell ceremony was held before sunset, open air, Tamer Square, next to Victoria Harbor. That's actually the former British Admiralty. An indoor ceremony, Hanover ceremony, Hong Kong Convention Exhibition Center, we could seat 4,000 people. It was the largest indoor venue we could find in Hong Kong. Now, so this worked, and uh, the lessons that I learned from this is that a leader has to be able to recognize a solution as it emerges and seize the moment to close the deal. Governor Patton could do that for Hong Kong. As for myself, I concluded that if you're stuck in a corner, think out of the box, do what is doable, and try your best to take into account the interests of all parties. Now, a few photographs. This is uh, Prince Charles and Governor Patton. Actually, the Chinese question and their forecast about the weather, inclement weather, was that right? <laughs> we had, you know, it, it was raining cats and dogs uh, on Tamer Square that evening. And when Prince Charles was giving his speech with his military naval uniform, the rainwater poured like poured like a waterfall <laughs> you know, in front of his eyes. So after the ceremony, uh, Robin Koch, the British Foreign Secretary, sent us a letter. He sent a letter to the then Chief Secretary, Anson Chen, and said, thank you very much to Stephen and his team for organizing the handover ceremony. And what fine British weather. <laughs> so it, it was raining when the British troops were parading. And this is the you know, actual handover ceremony. This is a few moments after midnight, the uh, British flag and the Hong Kong flag on that side of the screen had come down. And the uh, Chinese flag and the new Hong Kong flag uh, had gone up. So now some of my friends asked me, Stephen, this is an indoor venue. And uh, in an indoor venue, how come the flags could fly? You have huge fans? <laughs> so I told them, no, no, no huge fans some silence fans beneath the stage. And we bore a hole through the flagpoles, <laughs> made it hollow, and we have a blowhole at the top of, uh, of the flagpoles. So the gush of air would come from beneath the stage, go up the flagpoles, and out it comes. So it, it worked, you know, some lateral thinking, some imagination. And we crossed that political divide we were able to show the, the rest of the world that Hong Kong would continue to be open, free, international. So that's case number one, okay? We completed that job, and a few years later, by 2002, 
the Hong Kong government uh, appointed me as, uh, as a Secretary for Constitutional Affairs. And in that role, I had a, another difficult job dealing with electoral reforms. Now, you see, dealing with electoral reforms in Hong Kong meant major changes are constitutional. And if I want to promote that, then I need two thirds majority in the House, 46 out of 60 votes in the Legislative Council. And beyond that, we need to take the package to Beijing for endorsement by the National People's Congress Standing Committee. So two steep hurdles to cross. And that job was too difficult for me to handle alone. So by 2004, about two years into the new job, at the uh, suggestion of a senior pastor, uh, he suggested to me, Stephen, maybe you should form a prayer group among the Christian members of your cabinet. Maybe you should do that. So I decided to uh, follow his uh, proposition. And we formed a prayer group of four people. And every day, uh, Monday or uh, Thursday in the week, uh, we would go and have morning breakfast prayer. Somebody would be responsible for getting the Pacific coffee and the pineapple buns. <laughs> so we prayed about all our portfolios. And you know, by the time we were in 2009, uh, I had to handle a difficult issue. Now, you see, in Hong Kong, elections only started under British rule in 1985. And for that matter, indirect elections to begin with. So by the year 2009, uh, I was faced with this sort of composition in the House, 60 seats, 30 seats directly elected electorates one person, one vote, geographical constituencies, 3.2 million people. The other half of the house comprised of what we call functional constituencies. Now, what are functional constitu constituencies? These would be lawyers, doctors, engineers, accountants, chambers of commerce, trade unions, all electing their representatives to the house. And maximum, about 200,000 registered voters for these 30 seats. Now, so the franchises aren't balanced. And for many years, this was the subject of criticism. So by 2009, 2010, I had to do a review for the constitutional arrangements, for the electoral arrangements, and I needed to solve this problem. I did public consultation and discussions for nine months made no progress whatsoever. Out of uh, the 40 votes I needed, I could count 30 to, uh, 36 to 37 votes. So out of a 60, uh, ch 60 members chamber, I needed 40 votes. But whichever way I counted, I would miss it by several votes. So most of Hong Kong society thought that the deal was dead for this election to take place, electoral reforms for 2012. But we had our group of Christian ministers. We continued to pray. We refused to give up. And somehow it worked. So suddenly one day, mid-June 2010, I saw on TV, oh, uh, we can broadcast the chairman of one of the major opposition parties, the Democratic Party of Hong Kong, he announced if the Hong Kong government can proffer, can put forward a formula of one person, two votes, their party would support constitutional reforms for 2012. And then I knew if we could get this party from the opposition to cross the political divide, then two first majority would be doable. Now, what does one person, two votes mean? Very straightforward. The first vote for each person would still be in geographical constituencies. It would still be 3.2 million registered voters. But then the second vote for functional constituencies would also have to be expanded very significantly from 200,000 people to 3.2 million registered voters. Now, I knew that this would be a good thing to do. I also knew that's because it's a major change 
we needed the support of the council, the legislative council. We also needed the support of Beijing. So after that weekend, on 14th of June, Monday, myself and the Secretary for Justice, we had a meeting. And then we decided to go to see the chief executive, Donald Zhang. And we convened a meeting, seven or eight people around the table. Everybody spoke in unison. Chief executive, even though this is 11th hour, 10 days to the constitutional vote, proposed this to Beijing. He, he was pretty good. He did so at the 11th hour, and he rang Beijing. So two days later, 16th of June, Wednesday, public holiday, no work. So what did we do? Uh, the group of Christian ministers and you know, our spouses, we gathered again for a prayer meeting at the residence of the Secretary for Justice. And that afternoon, we prayed for two things. Firstly, Lord God, please turn the hearts of these leaders in Beijing. And secondly, please grant Hong Kong peace. And then we waited. Within a few days, got news from Beijing. One person, two votes, OK. So that following weekend, we could discuss with all the political parties. And then within a week, one person, two votes became constitutional reality. Votes was passed. Not just 40 votes out of 60. We got 46 votes out of 60, not just two first majority. We got more than three quarters majority. And this was the uh, uh, press uh, conference after the vote. So what lessons do I draw from this? People will say one week is a long time in politics. And that's very true. But to me personally, as a Christian who has served in government for all these years, this is what I would say. The heart of a king is like a stream in the hand of God. He turns it whichever way he wills. And in this particular instance, the leaders in Beijing, the chief executive in Hong Kong, and the political parties in our legislative council, they all exercised power. But we believe, I believe personally, that God turned their hearts. So from these two chapters of uh, practical issues that I had doubts with, what conclusions do I draw? I draw a few conclusions. Firstly, in public service, it is very important to be persistent. We pursue solutions until well past the, the 11th hour. Never give up. And secondly, yes, history evolves. But it is not all that's elusive. Personal attention, personal efforts, collective efforts made at the, at the moment which is critical can make a difference. And thirdly and finally, humility. You see, I glean many lessons from the Bible. And this lesson is very valuable to me. In whatever circumstances and whatever projects, whatever policy I'm dealing with, I try to remind myself, stay humble. Don't presume ever that the solution which you are proposing is the best. Particularly if you are in government, you listen to the opposition. They may well have a point. Always count others better than yourself. And then in any negotiations, don't just look after your own interests. Try to look after the interests of the other party. To the extent you are able to do that, your success is half guaranteed. That's what we try to do in these two constitutional political issues. And somehow, we pulled through. So thank you very much. Have a nice weekend. <laughs>